here. For those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, uh, I have had the real honor of serving as the co-chair of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine's Global Commission to create a global roadmap for healthy longevity. My uh, fabulous co-chair will follow me. That's John Wong uh, uh, from the National University of Singapore. Uh, for my background, I am a geriatrician in uh, what now feels like a prior lifetime. I was the chief of geriatric medicine at Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Institutions in Baltimore in the US. And for the last 14 years, I have served as the Dean at Columbia University's School of Public Health, as well as the director of the Butler Columbia Aging Center, which is a university-wide center uh, at Columbia University. So what I'd like to do uh, this morning is to introduce you in fairly short order to the Global Roadmaps Report. And in particular, I hope to inspire you with Vision 2050, which is what the roadmap starts with. So let's see, how do I advance the slides? I'm sorry, you don't have a clicker, Becky, just hit the, oh, okay. the keyboard. Hopefully this will work, yes. So I'd like to start by just reminding us that longevity is something that human societies have created. We have built this through intentional investment in human capital and the conditions that have actually in, enabled humans to add 30 years to human life expectancy in the last 100 years, unprecedented in the history of the world to create a new life stage, which is what we've done. What that, of course, if we have added 30 years to human life expectancy, what happens, not surprisingly, is people start living longer. Our populations are longer lived. And so the population pyramid across the world, these are global data, um, has gone from most people uh, living short lives uh, and a few people living longer to increasingly over time, this is the current state in the world of more and more people living longer. This is, this is the proportion of the population at zero to nine years of age, 10 to 19, up to 90 and older. And yet for both men and women, and you can see that the proportion living longer is increasing. By 2050, we will see close globally uh, we're closing in on equal proportions of people at every age of life. This is a radical transition in the history of the world, uh, built of our investments in the opportunity for people to live longer lives. And what has happened is that just now, the world has crossed a trans, uh, an unprecedented, tra unprecedented transition point of more people 65 and older around the world than children under five. Individual countries like the US crossed another transition point this year, which is more people over 65 than under 15. Um, these are dramatic shifts in who we are as a society. And the question is, what will this mean? And in particular, in the mission of the National Academy of Medicine, um, we real, the National Academy realized that the question hanging over us is what we do with these longer years. And will they be lived with health or without it? Uh, and in fact, the data are that people are living longer lives around the world and in each of our countries, but with more ill health for more years. Does it have to be that way? And what choice will we make? In fact, the evidence supports the potential for people to live long lives with health, that it is possible. And we are seeing that in uh, high income countries among the more well resourced subsets of the population, but not in those with less. So the National Academy of Medicine started with a set of questions and observations that overall, there were very mixed levels of preparedness globally. That if you've added a new life stage to human life, in societies designed, for the most part, when life expectancy was half of what it is, 
are we ready for societies of longer lives? And in fact, the assessment was that very few countries are prepared to both meet, meet the needs and seize, recognize and seize the opportunities of longer lives and are subsumed in the policy dimension by concerns about our leading policy metric, the old age dependency ratio, which suggests that more older people will crash our economies and our societies and deprive us of resources to invest in, uh, in societal thriving. Their assessment was that many countries do well on one dimension of aging preparedness, but do poorly on others. And there are few countries that score well on the multiple dimensions that will be required. And too many have really not gotten to first base, if you will, uh, in terms of getting going on the transitions for, that we need to make for societies of longer lives. So the National Academy of Medicine determined that preparing with vision, financially, societally, and, and scientifically for longer lifespans with health is a global imperative. <laughs> With that background, uh, Victor Zhao, uh, the president of the National Academy of Medicine, convened an international oversight board. Uh, some of the people on this list may well be familiar to you um, to say, well, this is the first and leading grand challenge for the US and the world is how we transition to, to a successful society of longer lives. Um, and the, it was the first time ever that the National Academy of Medicine actually said there was a global grand challenge that we were ignoring, but it was the grand challenge of our century. The second one, uh, three years later, just started, is a grand challenge on climate change and its impacts on health. The statement of task, uh, once they decided they needed to tackle this and would create a global commission, the statement of task was that we must identify the ways to strengthen communities and enrich the lives of older people in the context of societal thriving. So the commission was asked to assess the challenges presented by global aging and demonstrate how these could be translated into opportunities for societies globally recommend the approaches to doing that, identify the, the research that was needed for the missing pieces of evidence and solutions that are needed, and coordinate with other global initiatives that are similarly focused. And I'm, I'm delighted, for example, that Alana Officer is here, uh, and she has been leading the World Health Organization's uh, Decade of Global Aging with aligned and, and very similar goals. As I said, I had the, I've had the privilege of co-chairing this global commission with John Wong. Um, I'm thrilled that Andrew Scott has been a member of the commission, as well as an uh, eminent group of people from all over, from all continents of the world. The commission started with a definition, a definition of what our aspirations are which is the creation of healthy longevity, defined as the state in which years in good health approach the biological lifespan uh, with physical, cognitive, and social functioning, enabling well-being across populations, and determined that this could be accomplished if we actually invest in creating health and promoting health across the life course. Uh, so that people arrive at old age healthy and have the opportunity to stay healthy. Uh, in other words, a goal of preserving health for all into the oldest stages. Now, you might say, well, that's fine and good, but why should I care? Um, and many people do say that. Uh, well, one reason to care perhaps is that we have are living longer lives. And the question is, how do, is there a way to optimize that so people are living them with health and the opportunities that we want as individuals? The other, of course, is that the reality is that we're going to be living in a world of what some have called beanpole families, 
many generations alive at the same time, more than we've ever seen before, with the opportunity for intergenerational supports uh, in ways that are unprecedented. But I think the secret is that science tells us, as well as human experience, that as we get older, we accrue assets that we have never seen before like this at scale. And those intrinsic assets, and I'm not talking financially here as well, although of course people accrue financial assets potentially across their life course. But in fact, as we get older, the evidence is, is strong that not only do we acquire expertise and experience, and that does not go away, um, but as we get older, we actually develop higher order cognitive skills such that older people are actually much more experienced at recognizing and solving complex problems and with the capability to bring in sub, uh, a lifetime of subjective experience to decide which problems deeply matter, what is of value, and um, if that those things align to actually to have the patience to stick with it until those problems get solved and the ability to take them apart to put solutions in place. One dimension of how that um, acts out is that the science says that as we get older, we're much more successful at conflict resolution than we were when we were young. Um, but many other dimensions of how those skills play out. We also have learned that as people get older, we develop socio-emotional attributes, uh, higher levels of emotional well-being and emotional stability, but also clarity about what matters um, in, in the human life. And uh, an attribute of people as they get older that we become more pro-social, more ready to contribute to the well-being of others in our communities and around us, more concerned about the future of others. Uh, that compared to younger people. There is some literature that says that all of the things I've just mentioned actually add up to what we colloquially call wisdom, but sum up to attributes that um, actually know how to pull all of these things together. There's also life stage goals and priorities which change as people realize that they are nearing the end of their life, that they're mortal beings with limited time. And, and people seek meaning and connection, a reason to get up in the morning that matters, that has value in the, to and in the world. Um, the ability to give back and to be generative and to assure that your time on earth mattered uh, in some ways that will last beyond you. All in the context of caring about the long-term future, but with a sense of urgency to get it done. Now we have never had this many older people with the potential to have this depth of human capital um, that is quite related to the opportunity to live a longer life. The implications for society, if we actually enable these assets to make the difference that people want to make, is very large. Um, it could create the ability to thrive, and I'll come back to that, and optimism for the young about what a longer life might mean. So with that background, the National Academy of Medicine asked the question of what can we do? And the next stage, of course, was to recognize that a lot of our policy assumptions, a lot of our practice assumptions are based on myths that are highly prevalent, that are um, assumed to be true, but have been debunked. It's very clear that aging is not just about needs. As I just said, older adults bring assets of immense real and potential value, but we don't have a society built to enable people to use them at scale. It's very clear that generations do not need to be in competition and that longer lives could actually benefit young people and strengthen all of society. 
It's very clear that contrary to some assumptions, intergenerational teams are more productive and more innovative than single generation teams. It's very clear that older people are committed to the future. In fact, I have come through this process to the conclusion that we should think about older age as being the pay it forward stage of life. And finally, it's very clear that in almost any dimension that we look at, designing for older adults turns out to be a better design for all ages. So with that background, um, the commission decided we needed to assess the evidence, understand where we could get to, and then think about how to do it. And to do that, recognizing we're living in societies not designed for long lives, we had to imagine what the evidence says what said is possible in order uh, and not be constrained by how to make incremental changes in what already exists. Because what is possible is not completely, would not be possible just making incremental changes. The way to do that is to reach for what's called a future bank vision, where the changes needed are not linear, they're really um, uh, transformational. In order to describe what a society could look like that having fully utilized the evidence of what is possible, will have created healthy longevity and enabled its impact for a positive future for all ages. Well, here's what that, future back vision looks like for individuals. That by 2050, if we use the evidence of what's possible, if we met people's needs in transformational ways, that all people would have been enabled to have long lives with health and function into the oldest stages and to have had and have agency in the creation of their own health. That aging associated needs are well met by 2050 for long lives of dignity. That healthy older people have the full opportunity with health to be able to engage in meaningful and productive activities that meet their own goals, whether it's working for pay or bringing their social capital to contribute to societal and intergenerational well being and really build and lead a better future. If they had the opportunities to do that, conditioned on achieving health in the older age, we would see the, <laughs> what has emerged in 21st century society as loneliness and social isolation, a default condition of getting older, we would see that diminish dramatically because people had a place in society into the older stages. And in this vision, the evidence is that young adults would have greater intergenerational support and in fact, contrary to myth, more job opportunities. So that's a vision of what we could achieve for individuals. What would that add up to for societies? A long health span as well as a long lifespan and the resolution of health disparities across socioeconomic groups that are currently norm um, but in fact, when diminished is what is going to be critical in enabling all people to have the opportunity to live long lives with health. We would have a society in which the intrinsic assets and goals of older people are valued and enabled with all of society benefiting from that, from their societal roles, their work contributions, their volunteering gifts. And the return on investment the evidence is clear, would be very high for all of society. An enlarged workforce working longer if people want or need to in, into older age, a stronger economy, and an increased ability to invest back in human capital and public goods with lower costs for health care because of increased rates of good health. Young people being more successful with more jobs and less disaffection. And enhanced social capital with strong pro-social goals. And the conditions set for equity, intergenerational cohesion, and decreased precarity, both within and between countries. <laughs> the evidence is quite strong that in these conditions, when older people are thriving, all people and economies can thrive. 
So what are the returns on investment here with appropriate investment? First, that health can be enabled into the older stages, that we would see health as an asset, which increases workforce productivity, the potential for people to work longer if they want or need to, decreased disparities in medical care costs, and coming, I hope, out of COVID, uh, a recognition that the high vulnerability to pandemics is particularly driven by a population living with ill health. And, uh, and so lowering vulnerability to pandemics. The economic returns on healthy longevity investments could be reaped into the oldest stages. Concerns about diminishing numbers of young people could be solved by older people choosing to work longer and with an increased labor supply. Um, in many sectors as well, can, uh, there's much to be said about this, but consumers value service by older workers and consumer products also for older people drive uh, the huge economic potential. The evidence is very strong that if more older people are working, the economy is stronger and there are more jobs for young people. This is not a case of intergenerational competition. And of course, longer work lives <clears throat> can mean less burden on pensions and social security. The other thing is that given the pro-social goals of older people, creating roles and opportunities to give back for older people through volunteering, uh, as well as a recognition of the value of caregiving that many older people provide, um, contributes significantly, not just to the GDP, if you, value, if you monetize that value, but contributes significantly to societal well-being. So finally, the, the capabilities and goals of older adults, if utilized well, bring new human and social capital potential, as well as increased GDP. Now, many people listening to this will say, you're out of your mind. This sounds really great, highly altruistic. But how, how on earth could this be realistic? Um, I'm summarizing a 200 page global roadmap in less than 20 minutes, I hope. Uh, so I, I leave it to you to read the evidence, but having very carefully over three years assessed the evidence, it is clear that this is accomplishable if we hold on to the vision of what we're going for. And it's accomplishable with a high return on investment. Um, and, um, and a potential to unleash really the opportunities of the longer lives we've created. In fact, it's costly not to do this if you think of the costs of inaction. How do we afford more people living long lives with worse health? How do we afford a GDP that will be and is lower than it would be if a population was in better health and contributing economically, as well as to community well being. The costs of inaction would be increased fiscal burdens on government, increased financial burdens on individuals and family, and societal loss of the opportunities and contributions that older people can make and want to make. And loss of opportunity intergenerationally, as well as in terms of jobs and investing in their future for young people. So the costs of inaction are high, but return on investment is high. So I'd like to turn for the last couple of minutes to the recommendations of the, the global roadmap. And I'll start with the two high level goals that match what I've been talking about in terms of vision. <laughs> that there can be huge economic and social benefits generated by people living, working, volunteering, and engaging longer in their long lives. And we need to turn to how to can create the social infrastructure, the institutions, and the business systems that enable safe and meaningful work into older age and other community engagement at every stage of life. What could that what do we have to turn to to figure out how to accomplish that? Well, I just talked about a longevity dividend, if you will, of longer periods of life with health, um, with 
uh, with longer periods of work, um, decisions about when to retire whether, rather than having to retire, uh, the opportunity to volunteer and contribute to one's community, and predicated on an opportunity to learn throughout one's life. What would that take? Well, the underlying conditions to accomplish this really draw on the changes we need to make across multiple systems, our social infrastructure, our health systems, and our physical environment. And Dr. Wong will be describing for you in, uh, shortly what the specific recommendations are, the, are for those. But I wanna point out that this is a multi-sector proposition to be able to create the conditions in which people age with health and therefore are able to engage in aging. The specific recommendations in terms of the longevity dividend are that governments in collaboration with the business sector, with unions and educational institutions and all of society need to decide to design work environments and the opportunities for work for older people and to develop new policies that enable and encourage older adults to remain in the workforce longer. We cannot afford to put everybody who reaches what we call currently call retirement age on the shelf. Um, and they cannot afford it, but they also don't uniformly want it. We also need to create opportunities, new ones, for people to stay engaged in their communities and volunteering roles and roles that utilize their assets that they've accrued over their lifetime and enable people to have roles with meaning and purpose and, to, and, and, giving, and the opportunity to give back. And these roles often actually amplify health and are part of a health promotion strategy. And finally, we need to invest in redesigning education systems to support lifelong learning and training and to invest in the science of learning and, and training for middle-aged and older adults about which we know too little. And finally, develop pilots to explore how to help older adults retool for their next career in a lifetime of multiple careers. So I'll end here by saying that what I presented to you is a, an analysis that says that accomplishing healthy longevity at the top of this graph individual and societal health and well-being and the opportunity for productive engagement with roles, even responsibilities into older ages requires multi-sector change. This is an all of society proposition for the reasons that I've said. And if we do that and we drive healthy longevity, then we actually create a virtuous cycle of enhancing human social and financial capital across the life course, which further drives our ability to keep investing and strengthening the enablers um, that cause this to happen, centered on a social compact of what we're trying to accomplish through human well-being and thriving. <laughs> Dr. Wong is about is going to dive into the three social health system and physical environment sets of recommendations that can drive this. Um, but just to end by saying that healthy longevity has to be about all aspects of life and requires an all of society transformation across sectors, aligned on shared goals and a commitment to transform or incrementally evolve the ways that we've designed society to the present. Innovation in a complex system problem, innovation in any one sector will never be sufficient for the kind of transformation that we could accomplish. And this involves all of us, uh, governments, non-governmental and multilateral organizations, the private sector, absolutely, local communities, the academic community, and all of us in our community, the communities we live in. All sectors have to align to a shared goal. And finally, what would the implications be? By increasing healthy longevity, societies can minimize individual and societal burdens of living long lives without health 
and benefit from the continued engagement of adults in older age who bring assets we've never seen before at scale, but could have. Thank you.